Hi everyone, uh, this is the History of South Africa course at Flagler College. Um, we're going to turn our attention at this point to a discussion of the period between 1870 and 1910. Um, this uh, is the period of, well, British imperialism in particular, which is why I've titled it this way. Um, but uh, it could also be called the colonial period of South Africa. Um, uh, corresponding with sort of colonialism in general across the world and especially in, in the continent of Africa. Um, and some of these broader happenings uh, across the world uh, impinge on the experience of South Africa, both those of the European settlers there and of the, uh, the native population. Um, so we will start a discussion uh, of this period with a, an overview of many of the events um, and also some discussion of the, the major circumstances and issues that uh, uh, made this era what it was and uh, which had an impact on uh, subsequent events as well. Okay, so just a kind of rundown of some of the key events here. In 1867, diamonds were discovered um, in the Eastern Cape region, actually this area right around uh, the confluence of the kind of northeastern Cape and uh, the southern part of the Orange Free State. Um, and some of this territory was actually claimed by the Griqua. Um, and so this was in a, uh, a borderland, a heavily disputed zone. Um, when uh, the wealth of the diamonds uh, became apparent. It took some time for, you know, the, the richest diamond deposits to be found, uh, specifically those uh, in the, the area around what became the town of Kimberley. Um, once that, the, the vast wealth that could be uh, obtained from the diamond fields became known, Britain simply annexed that region. Um, this, of course, angered the Afrikaners. It's, uh, upset others who had claim to that land, and we will talk about that, the, the uh, Tswana people, um, uh, the Griqua, and others all had a kind of stake in that area. Uh, the British simply annexed it. And moreover, um, this in 1871, this was also the time when Cape Colony incorporated Basutu land, which had been an independent colony before that time, uh, this would be a short-lived experiment um, before it became untenable and, and Sutuland was returned to uh, its independent status as a separate colony. Um, in 1877, Britain decided to annex the Transvaal, or uh, what is labeled here on the map, the South African Republic. And we will talk uh, in later discussions about why that was the case and, and how that happened. Um, but Britain, it's, it's pretty obvious here, was... Um, in a mood to expand, uh, to stretch its um, uh, its empire, um, and again we will we will have a discussion uh, about the causes behind that. In 1879, um, Britain fought a war against the Zulus. This was the uh, the most independent and and uh, most powerful of all of the remaining native political entities. Um, after some initial setbacks, the British uh, defeated the Zulu and uh, incorporated their land into the empire, though keeping out uh, what they called some reserves, but opening up, opening up much of the land to um, European settlement. Uh, in 1881, um, only four years after the British annexed the Transvaal, the Afrikaners staged a full-scale rebellion against uh, the British, leading uh, the British government to um, set them up not as, as a fully independent entity, but as a quasi-independent with only um, uh, supervision from the British Empire. Um, and so there's this kind of back and forth between efforts uh, of the British to exert greater control over uh, the various territories in South Africa, um, specifically those that are not fully incorporated into its colonial system, um, and uh, it's um, sort of scaling back those activities. Um, and this has a lot to do with debates going on in the British government in this period over uh, the shape of its empire, um, both physically and kind of conceptually, uh, and the um, 
the waxing and waning of um, uh, especially offer Connor uh, desires for independence and their chafing under uh, British control. In 1884, uh, after uh, a number of setbacks and, and uh, frustrations uh, that the British experienced, uh, or rather I should say that the, the uh, Cape Colony experienced, in trying to govern Basutu land directly, they reasserted the independence of Basutu land uh, and made it a separate colony. Though, as I've said before, it, it was really it really functioned more as a protectorate than a colony. In 1885, Britain uh, established a protectorate over Bechuana land, and it did this because this corresponded in time with the Berlin Conference, um, uh, which I'll discuss later. Um, this was the occasion when. Uh, uh, the European, various European powers uh, got together and kind of divided up the map of Africa um, uh, into, into different spheres of influence or different colonial uh, empires. And uh, the Germans um, laid claim at that point to what they called Southwest Africa, what is now known as Namibia. Um, and fearing that um, the Afrikaners here, who were more um, akin in many ways culturally to the Germans than they were to the British, um, uh, they feared that they would open up a, a direct linkage here and, and sort of cut South Africa off from <clears throat> the territories to the north that the British claimed. Um, and so they established this protectorate to really create a, a wedge between the Germans and the Afrikaners. Um, in 1886, gold was discovered in the Witwatersrand region, uh, that is the Whitewater Ridge, um, that is up here in the Transvaal um, and uh, the town, later the city of Johannesburg, grew up almost overnight uh, around those gold fields. Um, and, uh, you know, this the, the gold mining came to dominate much of the economy of Southern Africa. Uh, in 1889, uh, a fellow who had been involved in uh, both the diamond and gold trades um, and had inserted himself into, uh, in a major way, into the politics of South Africa, a guy named Cecil Rhodes, um, about whom we will have plenty to say. Um, he annexed the territory north of the Limpopo River, um, so this area up here, what is now Zimbabwe, uh, and actually also Zambia. Uh, this came to be called Rhodesia after Rhodes, um, and uh, he opened it up to British settlement, um, which was never uh, in, uh, never a, a very kind of large flow, um, but there were some British settlers who went there, um, and that has its own uh, history, which impinges on the history of South Africa, so we will discuss it to some extent. In 1896, Rhodes, in cooperation with um, some authorities, uh, the South African company um, who had uh, settled um, uh, Rhodesia and also had some presence in the Bechuana uh, Protectorate, uh, Rhodes colluded with a, a guy named Leander Star Jameson um, to um, attack the Transvaal and uh, with the goal of creating an uprising among the British uh, settlers there and overthrowing the Afrikaner government. Um, this ended in a, in a miserable failure. Um, uh, the Jameson raid was, was a debacle almost from the beginning. In fact, Rhodes had tried to put a stop to it, but due to the um, lack of uh, instant communication, uh, shall we say, um, not that he knew that that was a thing, um, <clears throat> but uh, he was not able to establish contact with Jameson to call off the raid. Um, and this really kind of ended Rhodes's career in South African politics. Um, it did not, however, uh, end the British pretensions on the Transvaal. Um, if anything, it, uh, it, it stepped him into higher gear, but uh, with a different approach, right? Um, uh, and that those escalating tensions led ultimately to a war between the British and the Afrikaners, uh, which is called, um, by scholars at least, uh, the South African War. Colloquially, the British referred to this as the Boer War, uh, after that kind of slang term for, uh, for the Afrikaners, the Boers. Um, and this was one of the defining moments in South African history, and we will need to deal with this in, uh, in great detail. Um, the British won the war, though, at great cost, um, both uh, in terms of the number of lives lost and uh, 
um, in terms of you know, kind of the, the effect that this had on British politics. Um, it led to a scaling back of uh, imperial designs, um, not only on South Africa, but, you know, to some extent uh, worldwide. Um, and uh, this scaling back uh, led to the overthrow of the conservative government, ultimately, in, in Parliament, um, and to the establishment of a liberal government there, um, which was less intent on extending its uh, British imperial possessions. Um, and this brought about a kind of compromise uh, that produced unification of all of the colonies and republics in South Africa into a unified South Africa, still under British rule, under British auspices, but mostly self-governed. Um, and that will take us to our next period of time. Okay. Um, now, just a few comments here about the circumstances of this period that are tremendously important. And I've hinted at these already. Um, one, and this one's really very obvious, um, Minerals change everything. And by minerals, I really mean diamonds and gold. Okay, For the first time, uh, due to the discovery of diamonds and then subsequently of gold, um, South Africa entered the world economy in a major way. Up to this point, South Africa was still seen by the British and really by everyone, uh, except for the, the Afrikaners who, uh, and, of course, the natives um, who dwelt there um, because it was their home. Uh, was seen by you know by the, the broader global community as simply a way station, um, a stopping point uh, between destinations, and in fact that had increased, uh, I, should, I should say, decreased in importance uh, due to the building of the Suez Canal in the 1860s. No longer was it necessary for British ships to go around South Africa, um, and so you know South Africa had, in some ways, diminished in importance, or it was diminishing. Um, but uh, the discovery of diamonds coincided almost exactly with the opening of the Suez Canal, um, and that meant that South Africa did not pass into oblivion as an, an imperial possession, but rather uh, became tremendously important because it, uh, it produced a lot of wealth. Um, the colonies, uh, the British colony of the Cape and uh, the various republics, the Orange Free State, the Transvaal, um, and other political entities like the, the Griqualand and, and uh, uh, various African chiefdoms all vied for the wealth that came from minerals, and that um, is one of the defining features of this period. <coughs> the employment of Africans in the mines uh, set an important precedent in a number of ways. First of all, Africans were often coerced uh, into working in the mines, or they were incentivized in other ways that could be uh, called coercion. Um, but uh, the mines created uh, a greater need than ever before for cheap labor. On the other hand, uh, whites also worked in the mines, and this period saw a separation of races in these labor conditions where whites were offered the skilled labor positions um, and the blacks, the Africans, I should say, were um, offered only unskilled positions. There was a huge disparity uh, in pay, in benefits, uh, in working conditions, in just about every conceivable um, feature of this job, uh, the whites were given the, the privileged positions um, and the safer and uh, more desirable positions. And this is important because, you know, the, these, uh, the society, I should say, that the mines create, the society of laborers, really um, acts as a, uh, a template for uh, the whole of South African society going forward, right? Where the whites are given the privileges, the blacks are not. So the blacks are needed for labor um, because mining is a very labor-intensive thing, um, and so they need to be uh, incentivized and even coerced into uh, doing that work. Um, but the whites are the ones who benefit, uh, well, exponentially more than the Africans do from this. Um, at the same time, Africans, you know, were driven to mine labor um, uh, at an increasing pace because it offered better opportunities, given that much of, most of the land that was available to Africans had been now been claimed by whites. Um, and the best farmland at that. Um, and so, you know, the mines offered a much better 
opportunity for um, making a living than, than just about anything else did for, for these African laborers. Um, this is a period where the idea of tribalism became tremendously important uh, in the conceptual space of South African society. Okay, um, The whites, uh, who would always sort of, you know, treat, uh, or I should say, function with Africans on an ad hoc basis, um, you know, they're Interactions with the Xhosa were different than, than those with the Zulu, for instance, or the Sutu, or the Tswana, or the Venda, or the Tsonga, or the Pedi, um, uh, or the Griqua, uh, for that matter, right? Um, but to divide these groups from each other, rather than have them collude, became a really important goal for the whites. Right, because if the blacks were to unite, they, they so dwarf the whites in numbers that uh, it would have major social and political ramifications. Okay, um, And given that the mines and later the development of industry brought people from the different chiefdoms, uh, different uh, African social groups together in the same space, uh, this necessity that the whites had, as they saw it, um, to keep these blacks divided from each other became all the more acute, in, at least in the, in the mind of the white South African. Um, now, tribalism in, uh, in truth was far less rigid than the whites made it out to be, or that they you know, kind of necessitated it. Uh, um, there was a great deal of fluidity. Um, intermarriage between different groups, uh, alliances of various kinds. Uh, if we go back to Carolyn Hamilton's book on Shaka Zulu, for instance, uh, we might note that you know the whites attempted to create Shaka uh, to portray him as a conqueror of other peoples, and this is one of the ways that they you know tried to divide uh, different African groups from each other. They they played up the fact that the Zulus had defeated others. Uh, to bolster a kind of Zulu pride so they wouldn't collude with the Xhosa or with others. Um, at the same time, you know, they used uh, Zulu aggression in previous periods as a way to get other African groups to not like the Zulu, right? So this, they, they bred these tensions on purpose. Um, and so this is a dynamic uh, that we need to pay attention to and, and uh, that becomes apparent really first in, in this period that we're talking about here, late 19th century. Um, another group became more and more important, especially in Natal during this era, and that was the Indian population. Um, uh, more Indian laborers um, than ever were um, brought to South Africa to the extent that the Indian population came to eclipse that of the whites. Um, this atmosphere kick-started uh, the career of one of the most uh, important people of the 20th century, um, and that is, of course, Mohandas Gandhi. Uh, he spent 21 years um, as uh, a resident of Natal, um, as a lawyer working there, and uh, really put into place many of his reform ideas, as well as formulated uh, his notions of satyagraha, or you know, nonviolent uh, resistance. Um, uh, and his career in Natal then um, uh, had a tremendous impact on uh, what he did after he returned to India in 1914. Um, and so the you know we, we need to be aware of the happenings among the Indian population uh, in in Durban um, and in other parts of Natal. Uh, for the most part, this whole period, at least till the very end of the period, in the, the first decade of the 20th century, saw an uptick in British imperialism. Um, and this was due in part to the dominance of the conservative government, uh, first and foremost under Be Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, um, but uh, later under Lord Salisbury, um, the conservative government, you know, was very invested in empire, in growing the empire, and this desire extended to key uh, figures in um, in the South African setting, uh, most especially Cecil Rhodes, who was pictured here, uh, 
um, along with Alfred Bate, um, uh, a German entrepreneur who was also heavily involved in the diamond trade. But Cecil Rhodes is a, a towering figure over this whole period in South Africa, um, and he was of the very imperial stamp. Um, if you, um, anyway, so uh, a lot of this growth in, in uh, British imperialism had to do with um, a, a kind of parallel uh, growth in imperial designs of other countries. Um, Germany and Italy became unified uh, as nations in this period. Uh, Italy in the 1860s, Germany around 1870, uh, and Germany in particular was seen as the greatest threat to um, British hege hegemony over uh, much of the earth um, because Germany's industrial output uh, ended up dwarfing that, or not, I shouldn't say dwarfing, but it ended up eclipsing that of Britain. Uh, Germany became the most productive industrial nation in the world um, uh, in the late 19th century. Um, in 1885, uh, Otto von Bismarck, really just to, to kind of force the hand of his rivals, um, rather than out of any true desire to have African possessions, uh, convened a conference in Berlin where um, and the you know the British and French were kind of caught off guard and they 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 showed up at this uh, a bit um, uh, wrong footed. Uh, Bismarck managed to kind of get the the British and the French to uh, disagree with each other and and uh, but you know by the divide and conquer strategy um, he gained imperial possessions for himself and for his hangers-on, including King Leopold II of Belgium, uh, who claimed the entire Congo River Valley. Um, and so, you know, the, anyway, uh, these European powers ended up taking out maps of Africa and, and simply dividing it up without any attention paid to existing political realities on the ground among the, the various native inhabitants of Africa. Um, and, you know, the British uh, did not want to be caught wrong-footed wrong again. Um, and so, you know, the the 1880s and 1890s saw uh, even a, a greater uptick in British imperial pretensions. Um, this led to things like the Jameson Raids, um, formulated by Rhodes, um, and to the career in South Africa of Alfred Milner, um, uh, who is, I think, directly responsible for uh, the South African War in, from 1899 to 1902. Um, this also, this uh, uptick in imperial desire led to these various annexations that we've talked about, um, the annexation, the attempted annexation of the Transvaal, um, the annexation of most of the Zulu territory, the annexation of uh, New Matabele land, uh, and uh, the Shona territory, um, and what came to be called Rhodesia, what is now Zimbabwe. Um, all of these things are as a result of the growth in British imperialism um, in this era. And it should be said, uh, as a concluding point here, that this was not universal. You know, not every figure involved in British government was on board with this. There was an active opposition from the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party did not uh, entirely oppose empire. It was more wary about the unchecked growth of their empire, um, fearing some of the consequences, and, and uh, was quite prescient in, in uh, thinking those things. So that gives us an overview. Uh, we will then, um, in uh, subsequent lectures, talk about each of these major themes in turn, starting with uh, the discovery of, of diamonds and gold and the consequences those had. Uh, we will talk about the, 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 the conquests um, uh, of the remaining independent uh, African uh, chiefdoms, especially the Zulu, but a, a few others as well. Um, and uh, then the growth and tensions between the British and the Afrikaners culminating in the South African War and then the aftermath of that war. Um, so those, will, those are the remaining lectures um, and uh, look forward to discussing these things with you.